Hello, good evening. My name is Nathaniel Osgood, Director of the University of Saskatchewan's Computational Epidemiology Public Health Informatics, or CEPHAL lab. Uh, and uh, it's my great uh, pleasure and honor to be with you tonight to uh, provide a brief glimpse of the initial set of uh, COVID-19 dynamic models that's emerged from our extraordinary collaboration with the Saskatchewan Health Authority. Um, and I'd like to, in this regard, uh, offer my uh, particular gratitude for the leading role that uh, Jenny Basran has played. Maureen Anderson has also played an important role in, in providing the uh, epidemiological support uh, for um, uh, these projects. Um, but I want to extend my, my foremost uh, uh, gratitude, uh, appreciation, and admiration to the many students who have made this work possible. Um, including uh, the, the many central of which are, are listed here. Um, their extraordinary efforts and um, exceptional craftsmanship um, have made uh, uh, an enormous contribution within a comparatively little period of time of about two months that we've been working on these models. Um, Given that my goal tonight is to provide only the briefest glimpse, um, I apologize for the breakneck speed with which I'll be covering these models. Um, a growing number of them will be covered in greater detail in um, some of the projects, uh, project-specific videos that uh, I'll be sharing with YouTube. One of them, um, that on uh, particle filtering, is already there. And I'll thus be going a bit lighter on that, that project uh, particularly. So the, the work of this advanced analytics program um, uh, has been focused on providing public health and acute care planning and ongoing strategic and operational guidance to the Saskatchewan Health Authority and Chief Medical Officer of the province, Dr. Sagib Sahab. Um, and uh, as noted, it's, it's only been made possible by the extraordinary leadership of, of Dr. Jenny Bazran. Um, uh, our work uh, within this broader uh, program um, links in um, very closely with uh, work elsewhere in the health authority, uh, but um, particularly draws on uh, cross-linking of, of different lines of research. Uh, the first is the topic of my uh, brief glimpse today, the dynamic and hybrid modeling. <clears throat> but this work also embraces within our lab work on social media, 811 uh, health line mining um, and analysis, uh, such as that led by uh, um, uh, Janelle Bershide, and uh, smartphone-based data collection, which will assume in the, in the field tapping um, uh, our uh, very powerful um, Ethica um, uh, research program, um, but also drawing some um, uh, some insights as well from um, for larger larger deployments of the uh, Ethica contact tracker app separately, not for research use, but uh, but rather for um, operational use in uh, providing individuals the guidance they need to protect themselves and others um, from uh, COVID infection at scale. Uh, so the dynamic models are being pursued by uh, Cephal as part of this program of work. Um, uh, span the gamut of, of uh, different modeling types uh, seen before you here. These include uh, broad aggregate compartmental models, um, uh, the most traditional of the sort listed here, um, which uh, have been used to provide a broad brush understanding of, of um, uh, where and uh, when um, uh, to intervene, um, provided a broad understanding of of dynamics uh, for guidance, overall peak timing, resource utilization for key resources such as uh, uh, invasive ventilators, non-invasive ventilators, hospital beds, and uh, the rough impact of a broad set of interventions. Um, but as anyone could tell you who's done a, a large amount of work jointly with compartmental models and, and uh, fine-grained models uh, at an individual level, uh, compartmental models are rather blunt instruments for looking at uh, very detailed uh, intervention effects. Um, they have difficulty capturing um, a very targeted interventions based on heterogeneity, based on a person's history, um, and representing the, the complex dynamics associated with uh, many types of interventions, including features such as contact tracing and um, uh, more complex uh, screening strategies. Um, they also have uh, challenges represent situated decision-making of great relevance to uh, 
things such as social distancing. So while these compartmental models have served as, as a sort of booster rocket to get us uh, to a certain point very quickly, um, uh, our attention and, and focus is increasingly um, on the other uh, three uh, bullet points here. Um, agent-based models, um, and we'll see uh, two major sets of them. The first uh, focusing on a GIS-type model that um, uh, provides exceptionally fine-grained uh, capacity to examine effects of public health interventions, um, um, uh, characterization of healthcare worker and nosocomial infection transmission and the impact of personal protective equipment use and, and impact of uh, mass as well as targeted screening, uh, the capacity to look at uh, community cohorting and, and contact tracing, um, as well as uh, uh, the dynamics of long-term uh, care facilities. Another model um, focuses more on behavioral factors and, and looks at uh, risk perceptions and, and, pr and care presentation and, and presentation for, for screening, different levels of isolation and quarantine and the adherence associated with them. So individual level, family level, uh, residential uh, level, and uh, indeed regional level. Um, and characterization, importantly, if the impact of a uh, smartphone tracking uh, app, such as that used by millions in Singapore with the Trace Together app and by our Ethica uh, contact tracer app, um, uh, which uh, has, has now been um, uh, rolled out um, in a way that uh, provides a very similar functionality, but in a richer way to supplement it um, for uh, care organizations and systems um, with uh, uh, ongoing rollout of, of materials uh, to individuals. Um, uh, in addition, um, we're tapping uh, link transmission and hospital uh, flow models. Um, these are hybrid models that capture in a, in a, uh, a compartmental fashion um, the uh, lower risk areas of the population, um, but characterize this in, in catchments um, with uh, where individuals are individuated, are budded off when reaching a certain level of, of risk, um, and we can capture their flow as individuals uh, through, um, uh, through the care seeking process, uh, hospital capacity utilization, um, the uh, emergency department, ICU and ward numbers, um, and indeed the uh, community discharge process, which is, uh, is, is likely to be quite complicated by uh, uh, risk of infection within the COVID processes, as well as the, the capacity to, although not currently tapping, the ability to represent nosocomial infection. A different set of models focus on, on combining dynamic modeling with machine learning for always updated models of the situation that are recurrently regrounded with the latest reports um, uh, epidemiologically on resource utilization in the future on testing now, et cetera, and are then used to estimate the underlying situation right now, what's going on right now out there in the population, how many likely undiagnosed individuals are there, how many individuals who are oligosymptomatic uh, or, or, or have persistent asymptomatic symptoms. Um, uh, what, what's the likely circulation rate of people? Um, these models allow us to probabilistically project forward to understand likely case counts in the near future and probabilistically evaluate intervention trade-offs in light of the current situation. In short, in short they turn rather blunt compartmental models, um, the rather blunt instruments that compartmental models are in general, um, uh, to in, in sharpen them and use them to greatest effect in understanding it by regrounding them uh, in observed uh, observed uh, empirical data. Um, so uh, within these compartmental models, I'm going to start with them. Um, uh, we we uh, represent a, a rather articulated depiction of the, po of the, uh, the population. Um, I'll actually show a, a brief glimpse uh, of these models, uh, if I may, here. Um, uh, this is uh, an example of compartmental model. We have uh, susceptibles and exposed stock, of, uh, a stock of um, early stage infective individuals who remain asymptomatic. Um, individuals can then present on with a successive levels of symptomology and risk of developing complications and presentations to uh, hospitals 
or they can go on to um, uh, a later stage uh, beyond um, risk of complications and to a stage where they're recovered. Individuals can, at different stages, um, also uh, be diagnosed and by uh, so being diagnosed, um, be recognized in case numbers uh, down here um, and counted. Uh, uh, individuals, in addition to going through this uh, natural history of infection via these pathways, can also um, uh, come in in an asymptomatic fashion, uh, a persistently asymptomatic or oligosymptomatic fashion, where they have such mild symptoms they wouldn't consider presenting for care. But through aspects of, uh, you know, of, of they, through aspects of active case finding, screening, contact tracing, they can be diagnosed up here. They can also be diagnosed by similar mechanisms down here or by um, active um, uh, presentation, passive case finding. Uh, so the model does represent uh, both these forms of case finding. Um, the models represent uh, uh, different levels of viral shedding posited to apply for asymptomatic individuals, both early stage and, and oligosymptomatic uh, uh, characterization of the diagnosis process, whether passive or active, through active, um, passive active uh, case finding. Better capturing delays associated with complication emergence um, of relevance and the marked um, impacts of time delays and in shaping um, our ability to, to assess uh, the situation using case counts and, and particularly uh, complication and, and presentation for, for hospital. Um, uh, we make use of North American evidence to refine our understanding of, of several things, including hospital care seeking and reproductive numbers. Um, and we have a significant representation, although blunt as it has to be for a, a, a um, compartmental model of contact tracing and screening. The model does feature um, an acuity and service stratified uh, level of, of acute care where we represent individuals according to their acuity, um, whether they're severe, critical, or, um, or neither, uh, mild, um, according to WHO standards. But we also represent their uh, service uh, demands, whether they need invasive ventilation, non-invasive ventilation, or neither, such as uh, bedside oxygen support. Um, uh, and, uh, and do so with recognition of the differential uh, uh, lengths of stays and, uh, and recovery times um, uh, associated with uh, different groups. Um, beyond these, uh, uh, these features, we have um, uh, aspects of uh, the capacity to represent physical distancing uh, interventions at sort of a rough aggregate uh, level. Um, I would noted different types of, of case findings. Um, so that's our, our, our first set of, of, of models here. Um, booster rocket got us a certain distance, allowed us to look at in broad rush ways uh, effects of interventions, how soon they have an effect, um, uh, setting expectations for the impact of arriving uh, infective individuals compared to those, uh, those endogenous, et cetera. Um, the next uh, ones I'll be talking about are agent-based models, and I'll, I'll actually start with this first one, this empirically rich intervention-oriented model. This is a, a GIS-informed um, model. It's a model that incorporates uh, geographic structure, and currently it focuses on the fair city of uh, Saskatoon, um, uh, of which we count ourselves lucky citizens. Um, uh, and uh, uh, individuals are, are represented together with uh, homes, uh, workplaces, long-term care facilities, um, hospitals in ways that are uh, geographically uh, situated and, and, and grounded. Um, uh, we can also represent uh, schools. Um, and, uh, and by so doing, we can reason about day-to-day uh, -day patterns and the degree to which their disruption impacts of uh, transmission of infection. Um, uh, we do have uh, individuals presenting through natural history of infection um, here, um, uh, according to various stages. This is informed by the uh, Imperial College um, model um, uh, of some acclaim. Uh, and uh, there is a representation of an asymptomatic as well as symptomatic infective stock 
uh, state in, as well as an exposed state. Um, there's some capacity to represent as a what if, um, as it were, a structural sensitivity analysis of uh, the uh, return of individuals from a recovered state to a susceptible state. Um, we do have age-specific risks represented uh, with this model representing as befits an agent-based model's rich capacity to represent heterogeneity uh, compared to uh, the rather crude uh, potential with uh, compartmental models. We can capture this, uh, uh, this aspects of, uh, of age-specific uh, factors, uh, for example, in a um, continuous fashion. Um, other inputs include the census population um, of, uh, of, of Saskatoon here, uh, school sizes, household size distributions uh, is drawn from Alberta, um, uh, pending uh, data from Saskatchewan, comparable data from Saskatchewan, hospital capacities and long-term care facilities, um, with this last one being provided by empirical data on Saskatoon. Um, uh, this model is uh, is exquisite in its capacity to represent fine-grained public health interventions. These include aspects of community cohorting, contact tracing at an individual level, um, uh, long-term care facility uh, characterization, so characterization of, of the size and composition, and indeed infection spread within long-term care facilities, um, uh, staff sharing, and and uh, dynamics associated with that, school closures, um, uh, and uh, different levels of workplace closures. Um, through some recent extensions, there's a capacity to look at changes in in-community mixing of individuals, neither at home nor workplace, um, nor school, and mass and targeted screening, um, and screening at different levels. There's also a capacity to look at the impacts of personal protective equipment use, um, uh, thereby reducing transmission probability in hospitals and uh, long-term care facilities. Screening within long-term care facilities is represented both for uh, uh, the residents and for staff, and um, we can examine uh, impacts of other interventions on uh, long-term care facilities given the, the very vulnerable status of the populations there. Um, uh, such as uh, closing long-term care facility uh, to visitors, as well as restricting the sharing of staff between long-term care facilities, um, thereby reducing the, uh, the probability that infection will be uh, brought between uh, two facilities, um, uh, as has been the case in, in uh, uh, British Columbia and uh, I believe in Ontario and uh, terrifyingly in um, Washington State. Um, <clears throat> healthcare elements uh, involved in this model include care seeking, um, uh, healthcare worker and nosocomial infection transmission. Um, so infection transmission within uh, long-term care facilities or indeed hospital. Um, uh, I had noted earlier person predictive equipment use, um, aspects of delays and queues uh, waiting for care and uh, testing. Um, although there is presumptive treatment uh, involved where a person can be presumptively admitted um, pending a, a test outcome. Um, hospitals within this model, compared to our, our later uh, hybrid model, are represented at a um, fairly elemental level. Um, um, but there are representations of, of individuals leaving without being seen or against medical advice when further down in the, um, uh, in the pathway. Um, there's triage, which takes place based on an individual's perceived acuity. Um, and there's testing that, that can go on. Um, individuals can be assigned bed, um, and, uh, and uh, decisions can be made with respect to, um, to transfers um, and allocation of uh, acute care equipment for individuals who, are, um, uh, who need uh, extra levels of care, such as with complications needing ventilators. Um, and there's uh, post uh, ICU care that's represented and sort of uh, delays associated with that. There can also be transfer to uh, other other facilities um, uh, that might be that might afford a um, a bed if this one cannot. Um, individuals can be asked to isolate uh, following um, uh, following departure. 
Um, there is uh, uh, capacitation supported. So for example, a number of ventilators that are limited that uh, can be allocated uh, for the most acute uh, individuals. Um, and various statistics can be uh, accumulated um, within this context. So there's a rough representation of, of care seeking and, uh, and flow through acute care facilities, although it is uh, a very modest in its uh, richness and level of depiction and level of resource use uh, recognition compared to other models in the hybrid, um, uh, hybrid model to be discussed later. For lab testing, we also capture um, um, dynamics associated with queuing, um, reflective of the limited capacity of our um, of our labs um, and indeed labs across uh, um, the world. Uh, so capacity is imposed. There's endogenous lab delays that result from limited capacity, um, uh, reflecting um, in this case predominantly um, uh, samples that that can be processed uh, per day or um, or swabs available, or, or other um, other aspects. Um, I believe actually I misspeak there. It's uh, um, and maybe reagents um, uh, and uh, delays impact diagnosis and, and reporting associated with cases. Although presumptive um, admittal can be uh, supported. So a um, although these are all odd results and shouldn't be taken as indicative of of current results, the model affords us a really um, detailed way of, of, of characterizing the dynamics over time associated with many key quantities in, the, in, in response to, uh, to various intervention regimes. For example, with um, accommodations, layering of school closures, business closures, no long-term care, visitors and community cohorting, what sort of test volumes and deaths and long-term care cases versus incident cases might we see? Or with social distancing and aggressive population screening? Um, we can also look at, at infections in long-term care facilities. Um, um, uh, you know, I thought um, just to enliven this, uh, perhaps we'd uh, uh, take a look a little bit at the, uh, the model itself. Um, uh, it was uh, said of, of Newton by Bernoulli, I, I believe, um, when submitting a, an anonymously marked um, problem for the Brachistochrony problem, that one recognizes the lion by his claw. And indeed, one recognizes the, the model author, Wade McDonald, here, by the um, uh, quality and, and clarity of his work. Um, uh, Wade is a uh, finishing master's student who we're fortunate to secure as a, uh, a doctoral student uh, in coming months as the outbreak uh, allows. And Wade is uh, doing remarkable work in building up this model um, in such short uh, term and time, uh, just, just a few weeks. Um, so we have models, uh, individuals depicted in terms of uh, dis uh, natural history of infection, in terms of their care needs, in including admission and, and need for uh, for hospitalization or hospital and hospital care seeking. Um, uh, isolation characteristics of, of an individual, including their placement in community cohort versus self-isolation, and whether or not they're indeed seeking care, something that behavioral considerations might, might shape um, or perceptions, um, although that's not currently a feature in the model. Individual's diagnosis status is, is captured. Um, uh, and um, in their, their current status as far as um, uh, mortality. This model is recommended by a remarkable representation of different features, whether it's lab testing in terms of uh, the uh, workflow process for, for testing depicted at a somewhat um, fine-grained level, uh, depiction of long-term care facilities, including a risk of, of needing individuals to be discharged to a hospital. Um, uh, characterization uh, associated with um, community cohorting um, and uh, again uh, risks that an individual will develop uh, symptoms. The contact tracing process which is depicted in a uh, articulated individual level uh, fashion with, uh, um, with the limited capacity to perform it being captured within the, uh, the timing. Um, uh, and uh, 
and then a depiction of workplaces and indeed hospital flow. Wade has done an exceptional job um, depicting so many aspects of, uh, of the context um, with age-specific differences, for example, and whether uh, individuals um, uh, are placed in, uh, in schools, uh, workplaces during the day, uh, at home, um, or remain at home through the day in response to social distancing, closures of, of their workplaces and, and schools. Um, uh, some older individuals live in long-term care facilities, others li live at home, age-specific risk captured, and uh, um, uh, individuals circulating these facilities uh, uh, can also be asked to, to quarantine, such as workers in long-term care or workers in a hospital. Um, really capturing many of the most salient aspects of the the terrible burden and uh, uh, fearsome uh, potential of this uh, of this pathogen. Um, uh, we we see uh, profound uh, opportunities for using this model to further examine the effects of of intervention. And so I've only provided you a small sliver of the remarkable uh, sets of results that have emerged uh, from it already. Another agent-based model uh, has rather different uh, foci, um, being focused more on uh, behavioral factors of perception of risk and, and um, its impact on care seeking or, or willingness to be tested, a willingness of individuals to adhere to quarantine or, or isolation and to engage in social distancing. Um, uh, there's a representation of, of, of mobility between um, regions that can be captured. Um, uh, and something that, that, reach, that uh, ripples through to number of infected cases. So there's also a representation in an overlap fashion with the last model with uh, uh, testing speed associated with um, uh, PCR tests that, uh, that, that test for uh, COVID positivity and the limited numbers of medical resources um, involved. Um, Quarantine is represented in a particularly articulated fashion within this model at the provincial, the residential and individual level area. Um, and we can represent that quarantine uh, at these more um, coarse grained levels to allow for say local mixing within those, uh, within those uh, regions. Um, uh, but but uh, quarantining can be done to prevent and alleviate uh, disease from um, this infection from disseminating away to other cities. Um, uh, and there can be resource support afforded by other cities, as was a marked feature of the outbreak uh, within Wuhan, where, uh, and indeed in Hubei province, where um, 40,000 or so uh, healthcare workers um, recruited from all the different provinces of China were sent to uh, Hubei province with, a, I believe, about half of them settling in the, the epicenter of Wuhan um, directly. Um, uh, we can also represent quarantine at a, as a red residential area to, to reduce uh, uh, outdoor activity um, uh, flow in and out of the residential area um, and, uh, and, and providing um, shielding of, of transportation resources and physicians. Or it can be provided at the individual level to protect um, uh, individuals from infecting others by self-quarantine, uh, separate from the, the family, or um, uh, quarantining in a community cohorting facility, or indeed uh, a family uh, isolated together with the family quarantine, but at risk of uh, being infected by the uh, index individual with infection um, who might be isolating amongst them. Um, uh, so uh, we do represent uh, community cohorting within this, which can um, provide a way for those individuals to be brought away from their facility, from their family, um, to, to avoid infecting them, and placed in a facility where they can be watched uh, with others of like status. So asymptomatic individuals with asymptomatic individuals to see if they develop uh, symptoms, in which case they'd go to another facility, or if they are... Um, remain clear and, and recovered, they can be um, following an isolation period, released back. Um, uh, or those with symptoms in a cohorting facility where we're, uh, we have them under medical watch to see if they develop complications, in which case we can 
promptly get them in for treatment. And this can help prevent um, swamping of medical facilities by individuals who have been symptomatic and, and are concerned uh, uh, going uh, presenting in large numbers to healthcare facilities. We can have a, a more controlled flow of individuals who really need that extra level of care and can be referred to the uh, hospital and, and brought there. Um, uh, hopefully by protected um, EMS vehicles. Um, so these community cohorting facilities can be used to, uh, uh, to also deliver home care services for the elderly, um, a, a very vulnerable group as well for, um, uh, for comorbid conditions as well as for COVID. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm not going to have time to go into results, but with a PCR test, um, um, we can examine the effects of different levels of, of, of testing. Um, and um, uh, we have here a mixture of uh, agent-based model uh, for um, a natural history of infection, lab test status, perception of risk, mobility behavior, and, and indeed purchasing behavior, something that um, was of interest in the Chinese context, but it, it has emerged as well as a, as a possible uh, clue to enhance social distancing measures associated with, uh, with food shopping, for example. Um, uh, discrete event simulation um, for medical resources and lab testing and, and um, representation of infection transmission. I regret that I don't have time to go through the detailed uh, uh, assumptions here. Uh, but they are, are, are rich and reflect a, a stronger um, a behavioral grounding, um, including a representation of personal protective behaviors and in terms of, of individuals. Um, uh, so we have individuals uh, recognized as being distinguished by age, by sex, and reflective of the high dangers associated with it by, by smoking status. Um, by test status, uh, mobility, um, um, uh, purchasing behavior and, and perception of risk. Um, and uh, like our other models, um, um, most of our other models, uh, we've uh, built uh, these in um, AnyLogic, which affords our stakeholders an opportunity to, to have uh, greater model transparency and provide feedback as to model assumptions to point out model gaps, which is one of the key needs and, and indeed one of the key advantages of dynamic models, taking these theories out of our head making them precise enough to be simulatable, to, to ask for their logical consequences over time, but also eliciting, either in terms of model structure or in terms of model results, critique for collective refinement and enhancement of our understanding. Models like this are not crystal balls that predict the future, but rather they're best viewed as learning processes that help us more quickly spot cases where our cherished understanding is off based and improve the model assumptions to better align with the underlying um, understanding of the situation as secured by diverse uh, system stakeholders. Um, so in this case, uh, we do represent natural history of infection, their status with respect to testing, perceptions of risk and mobility behavior. Um, and there's a mapping of of, of the natural history of infection onto familiar constructs such as incubation, latent period, et cetera. Um, medical resources are represented at a, a fairly uh, coarse grained level, but one that can capture the effects of delays and overload. And lab testing is also captured in terms of capacitation, in terms of its uh, limited capacity to process samples um, uh, only at a certain rate. Uh, model results uh, from this model are intriguing, and regrettably, I, I don't have time to cover them. But we can examine the effects of, of expedited um, testing, say fast versus slow PCR, um, uh, different levels of quarantine, um, abiding by quarantines, quarantine adherence, um, or to use an older term, compliance, uh, and, and the impacts of that on, on, on model findings. Um, issues of where to house uh, mildly symptomatic cases, whether in uh, community cohorting versus home quarantine and the impacts on, on infection um, with uh, different, um, different assumptions uh, being employed as to um, uh, the, uh, the role of uh, 
in, of individuals in isolation, I believe, here. Um, uh, so uh, we can also look at the impacts of delayed quarantine and uh, different levels of screening, such as uh, the occurrence of, of mass, uh, mass screening um, versus more targeted screening, um, screening in the community versus in the, uh, um, in the care facility. We can examine the impacts of, uh, of uh, di uh, uh, demographics on outcomes reflective of the uh, different levels of risk associated with individuals at, at different stages of the age spectrum. Um, the final model <clears throat> is a, uh, or final model I'm going to uh, comment on in, in any depth here, is the acute care capacity planning model, um, which uh, involves uh, a really uh, highly innovative uh, structure uh, reflective of the exceptional uh, strengths of its uh, creator, Yuan Tian, who uh, uh, works at uh, Health Quality Council, uh, uh, but, but is pursuing this work as part of our dissertation work uh, as well. Um, HQC has kindly uh, uh, offered her uh, time um, uh, for this. Um, uh, and the, uh, the model here employs a hybrid framework um, uh, as befits uh, much modeling these days to provide the flexibility to shift between frameworks and to provide the requisite level of resolution for different areas of, of, of a model while ensuring um, rapid uh, uh, computational frugality of model where, where it has little cost um, uh, to avoid fitting everything into the straitjacket of, of one um, modeling approach. Um, and afford us a uh, less blunt modeling approach than um, is is forced by a compartmental model alone. Um, so we have a COVID-19 transmission model, which makes use of a compartmental, although age-structured uh, transmission model. Um, but where individuals are individuated, um, that is uh, quantized, uh, they, are, um, uh, they are budded off into a, a full person. Um, uh, when they reach a certain point in the uh, in, in the risk spectrum, um, by becoming an individual, they can present for care, and there's a discrete event simulation of, pair, uh, of patient flow that's grounded um, uh, based on years uh, led by uh, by Yuan Tian, the the exceptional model creator here of modeling acute care flow within uh, our fair province of Saskatchewan, um, and there's a um, demographically uh, accurate depiction of the Saskatchewan population. Um, uh, this model is notable for affording within the transmission um, uh, context a representation of different um, catchment basins, as it were, for different, uh, um, different regions. Uh, we could represent, for example, different uh, provinces or, or different uh, regions within uh, Saskatchewan. Um, uh, and have different uh, have individuals flow down from from the demographics characteristics and mixing in that region to the acute care facility. Uh, there's some frequent uh, depiction of, of model dynamics. I won't have time to go into this in detail, but it's um, uh, familiar um, uh, to many of you. Uh, and uh, we have a uh, representation of uh, acute care flow and indeed the risk of of mortality um, and uh, different levels of uh, case presentation. Um, uh, within this context, um, there's uh, uh, a preference matrix that represents uh, many of the assumptions associated with mixing within the transmission. Individuals, recovered individuals are assumed to remain immune from reinfection. And uh, we treat isolated cases as effectively isolated at a level that they won't transmit the, the pathogen. Um, uh, this model does not yet consider possible transmission in the hospital or care facility, but it, um, it does represent an individual level in a way that would afford that. And indeed, this is one of the priorities. Um, uh, this is a, a dynamic model for running what-if scenarios, not a predictive model. And... Uh, uh, the assumption is that assumptions will be refined over time, including the representation of, for example, oligosymptomatic individuals, individuals who are 
who are persistently asymptomatic. Um, patient flow, for example, within a healthcare facility can be captured in this sort of way, and a transmission model uh, with different levels of, of flow. But unlike that first transmission model we see, we don't need to represent the acute care pathways in a compartmental model. We can take off those crude boxing gloves that were, were dealt by um, compartmental models and, and depict things at an individual level that, depict, that, that capture the relevant um, uh, dynamics that may be based on individual heterogeneity, um, uh, an individual's uh, presentation history, um, uh, that can capture resource limitations in a richer way and resource interdependencies um, uh, within, uh, within the context of an individual level characterization. So once an individual is, is butted off as an individual, they can be, uh, be represented from the standpoint of transmission um, and, uh, and flow down and indeed be discharged. And uh, this model has been used to examine at, a, at quite some level of, of detail the effects of um, contact tracing and, and uh, effects of uh, different levels of, of uh, social distancing. Um, uh, with with outcomes in terms of acute care bed use, ICU bed use, and ventilators specifically used for, for COVID patients. Um, the final uh, model I'll just give some uh, quick nod to, reflective of the fact that I already have a video posted on it, reflects the fact that we are, within the COVID outbreak um, prediction response context, we're dealing with a very fast moving outbreak, one that's evolving quickly over time in terms of the behavioral responses, um, in terms of the understanding of the epidemiology, in terms of the acute care utilization. Um, and uh, there's uh, many, um, many concerns about the, the need to uh, plan and mobilize health resources um, reflective of the way that the outbreak will uh, evolve. And whilst uh, traditional reporting often gives some sense as to where we're at, it often provides little clarity on, on what lies ahead. Um, the goal of this work is to really enable early, uh, early anticipation of the trajectory of, of incident cases and indeed of acute care utilization, uh, likely uh, in an emerging outbreak. Um, in light of the markedly evolving uh, character of the epidemic and notable stochastics. And I would note that um, with a nod towards the, um, um, the insightful article by uh, Pueo on, on the uh, hammer in the dance on, on uh, COVID, uh, uh, that, that these needs for adaptive planning in light of what's been observed and, and asking what does that mean in terms of what we have to do going forward and in terms of what we can expect, those needs are especially acute in the dance phase where we're adaptively learning what works, trying things, uh, pulling back, uh, et cetera. Um, so the goal here is to render the sorts of models we've seen earlier, and I include all those types, um, uh, from discrete products into uh, services and to things that provide ongoing insights reflective of a constant regrounding and new evidence. Evidence about case counts, evidence about uh, recoveries and deaths, evidence with respect to acute care utilization and capacity utilization and presentation in acute care as test volumes and, and test positive outcomes, et cetera. Um, these models being constantly refreshed um, and regrounded, they can be used to, to look forward for a week or, or days or, or a few weeks with really added confidence. Um, even with fairly blunt uh, compartmental models, they can be used to, to very good effect because they're constantly regrounded. They're auto-corrected, as it were. And they can be used to estimate the latent state of the system, the underlying state, project forward, but probably most importantly, um, to help understand the trade-off between scenarios in light of our new understanding, to make better decision-making in light of the emerging and unfolding um, observed epidemiology um, and in light of the public health and acute care burden um, noted. I, I like to analogize these to weather maps. Um, 
We're all used to depending on weather models, but as a basic feature of, of that sort of modeling, we expect those models to be regrounded on an ongoing basis with what's actually observed. Uh, a model from, uh, from uh, two weeks ago may have a weather estimate for tomorrow, but especially here in Saskatchewan, that weather estimate is often going to be quite far off. Uh, even the best of weather models is not going to be able to know exactly the path of a thunderstorm, a thundercloud, whether it's going to pass over the fair city of Saskatoon. Uh, it's not going to know, um, be able to anticipate the Chinook that sweeps down from, um, from the Rockies into uh, Calgary. Um, it's not going to be able to anticipate uh, the exact um, level of precipitation. And so we expect these models to be constantly regrounded in what's actually occurred, even if it's the same underlying model, to predict what's coming, to be regrounded in the current state of things, as it were. And so it is with any of the models we saw earlier. It's well enough to build a model and then seek to use it, but we'd like to use that model so that it's constantly up to date and it's always operating from what's currently the case. We'd like the model to learn over time and be able to project forward what we might anticipate. And critically, given these models are, are tools for, for thinking, for asking what if questions, they're, they're learning prostheses, we'd like to be able to, to use this regrounded model to estimate the impact of trade-offs between different sorts of interventions. The best way to get to where we want to get to in terms of healthcare burden, in terms of the, um, the burden on our public health resources, and indeed on, on, on health of the whole community. Um, given where we're at now, if the underlying situation is such that the, the whole of the, the data, when assembled jointly and triangulated, um, suggests that we're near the peak of the outbreak because a large number, say, of persistent asymptomatics or oligosymptomatic individuals around, what intervention is best may be very different than if we're in the very early stages. Um, so uh, we want a model that's constantly regrounded so that we can make more informed choices. And it really can have a very big impact on intervention choice. Now, over the years, we've used many techniques for this in our um, and indeed, there's, there's older techniques, yes. Um, I consider techniques like the Kalman filter very much along these lines, though a remarkably crude technique given its use of MLE-type uh, estimates and its reliance on um, very strict distributional assumptions and uh, uh, really restrictive assumptions about the form, the differential character, for example, of the underlying model, the fact we can compute a Jacobian. Um, Instead, these days, we make a heavy use of uh, sequential Monte Carlo processes in the form of particle filtering and, and particle MCMC. Um, and these techniques allow us to, 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 to sample from, well, with particle filtering, the underlying state of the system in light of unfolding uh, observations or evidence um, for a given set of parameters and model, or for particle MCMC, a more powerful technique yet, um, uh, to to uh, sample from both the underlying state of the system and the parameters in light of the unfolding uh, observations. Um, and our models are, are currently based on our compartmental models. Um, and we have different particle filter models, some of which are age structured at a rough level um, um, or otherwise age aggregate, um, uh, some that incorporate oligosymptomatic or persistent asymptomatic pathways and others uh, that depict layering of, of probabilistic uh, testing models um, within the model. Um, and uh, scenarios um, uh, have successfully run for this for a variety of jurisdictions. We're excited about our work with Dr. Alex Doroshenko in Alberta, where we're getting extraordinary results thanks to the work of, of, of uh, Alex and the extraordinary data, as well as uh, Xiao Yan Li who has uh, put that together into a fine set of performing scenarios to provide really clear insight into the underlying situation, where it's going, and by extension, um, provide a platform for examining what-if scenarios. Uh, but we also have uh, extraordinary results for, for Saskatchewan, um, providing that those key glimpses of what's going on, 
based on comparatively less data um, and, and lower case volumes. Uh, we have uh, good performing runs for Canada and well for uh, and and uh, runs also for the U.S. and Italy. Um, um, this model does represent differently uh, travel and non-travel cases. If you're looking at empirical data and, and growth in cases, it's really important to distinguish between uh, r cases that are arriving in growing fractions uh, that are infected um, uh, versus those that are endogenously uh, infected. Um, we have an incorporation of a testing module that makes sense of the evidence in light of of the number of tests performed, a key confounder and um, that really needs to be considered centrally by um, uh, by model, mo models in this view to, to really make sense of the evidence. Um, and um, and then uh, also uh, estimating um, aspects of contact uh, rates and, and presentation rates and, and, and testing parameters um, uh, that are estimated uh, by our particle filtering models. Um, uh, as noted, we, we are doing this for compartmental models now, but uh, in some extraordinary work, my uh, exceptional student, Leah Lamp, um, uh, she's doing some outstanding work adapting a similar framework for um, particle filtering of agent-based models um, and ultimately uh, probably hybrid models. Um, uh, the current status of this is uh, current ingestion of, of case, including travel-specific and testing data. Um, uh, really good match of behavior to uh, reliable data for multiple jurisdictions. Um, successful detection uh, by this framework of shifts in the et uh, epidemiology that have occurred, uh, indeed the behavioral regime. Um, the capacity to detect effects of interventions um, as reflected in said behavior. Uh, the capacity to estimate the current state, including the latent state of the system the capacity to project forward without a rapid growth and uncertainty, and support for examination of the effects of, of interventions. An example of this um, um, would be examination of, of uh, the model's uh, estimation of, uh, of cases over time, uh, both during the period where we have data coming in and, and, and observations coming in here on cases, comparing against the model versus projecting forward, or of estimating the, the effective reproductive number. Um, and indeed, a, a model of this sort can provide this extraordinary picture across multiple outputs of what's going on. For example, what fraction of people um, not, who are not merely oligosymptomatic, not merely persistently asymptomatic, are presenting for care? And, and, and what's the contact rate or effective reproductive number um, doing. You can see here how it fairly precipitously drops over a time frame that where, where major social distancing um, directives were issued by, uh, by our provincial government boldly here, and you can see the, the reproductive number drop accordingly. Following a general upsurge of it previously in a way that could have led to big outbreaks. I believe the, the provincial government uh, can take credit for preventing some major outbreaks in a way that's depicted over here in terms of the case counts being cut short uh, by that, uh, that, that what could have been a precipitous rise being cut short by the, uh, the occurrence of these interventions. You could see matches there to uh, cumulative case count data um, and, uh, and an attempt to match uh, death data some work to be done there reflect the fact that some cases um, who died may have been further along in their illness overseas. Um, we, we do see uh, the model estimating the number of undiagnosed individuals out there and reflect the fact that particle filtering involves this kind of competition of the fittest of different hypotheses for what's going on at any one time out there in the model with in this run, 30,000 of those hypotheses jockeying to explain the data. Some of the hypotheses which posit faster rates of growth in the number of cases were not fruitful. They did not, they did not effectively match the data. They were inconsistent with the data. So they were cut off, and the more fruitful ones were multiplied, the ones that were more consistent with the data. And there's this survival of the fittest um, 
by which these hypotheses duked it out, um, nature read in tooth and claw, and they um, uh, arrive at an understanding of the number of cases likely to be out there that's, that's smaller, uh, number of undiagnosed cases that, that may be reaching up uh, close in the next week to close to 400, but, but right now is probably closer to about 300 um, at our present time. And you can see it estimates this probabilistically. Um, probabilistically, for example, the probability per day of seeking care or the effective reproductive number that lets us assess the effects of interventions or this um, in the, um, the number of reported or, or uh, suspected cases. Um, and what this provides us is sort of this population tomography. Any one source of data, for example, uh, testing related data or data on, on case, uh, you know, diagnosed cases by whether they traveled or not and of deaths, for example, um, um, that sort of data and, and going forward acute care data, each type of data is very limited. It provides only a, a fragment of the picture of the whole system. And, and frankly, only comes from, you know, a, 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 a small part of the system. Um, it may come, for example, from, um, you know, uh, data related to, uh, to, to, to cases may come from individuals who present for care, for example, here, or individuals who are brought over by, uh, by active tracing or, or active screening. Um, uh, data related to uh, to testing might be uh, might include factors from um, passive presentation as well as um, uh, active active screening and contact tracing. Um, data on acute care presentation from individuals who who arrive at the uh, the hospital for care. Um, but the logic of the model, the the sort of um, underlying semantics of of the natural history of infection, of how diagnosis takes place, of the occurrence of oligosymptomatic pathway. It has a logic to it. And, and data from one area of the system often whispers to you about what's going on upstream, for example, what's driving it, just as much as if you, you saw a stream of people streaming into whatever room you're currently uh, in. From, uh, it might hint that there's a large amount of people in the next path over. So it is with this model. And, and a particle filter puts all that evidence together. It puts it together in evidence um, from these many pieces, these many types of evidence, into a piece of what's going on in the latent, in the state of the whole system. What's probably happening up here in the oligosymptomatic pathway or in these pathways, um, in these compartments. Even though we only observe diagnosed individuals flowing here, those individuals' counts whisper to us about what's going on elsewhere, um, particularly when we take into account traveling individuals and, and their, their, their arrival with illness. We distinguish them from endogenous individuals. So a model like this um, provides a, a way, as it were, providing a population tomography. Just as a, a computer tomo a tomographic machine, a CAT scan, provides images taken from very different angles, providing different slices through the body, as it were. Each image is terribly limited. It, it's, it's occluded, the, the radiation source is occluded by bones and lying in the way or, 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 uh, or uh, plates or screws, perhaps. Um, it, it has only a very limited field of view. It, it um, depicts only slices of organs. Um, each image is very limited, just like each data source streaming into our model is very limited. But the real uh, power of, of, of CAT scan is the ability to knit these together into a 3D view of what's going on biologically within his, the person. And indeed, ladies and gentlemen, that's what particle filtering, and even more powerfully yet, the particle MCMC being, being uh, uh, so well implemented with streaming data by uh, student uh, Lu Jie Zhuan and, um, and with help by uh, Li Sa Yan um, uh, to, to, to give these 3D pictures associated with what's going on throughout all the compartments of, of, of a population. Whispering, hearing, allowing us to, to listen carefully and hear through, um, through the data that we do have whispers about what's happening elsewhere 
and through the logic of the model that's captured in the model to reason about what that means about what's coming down the pike, about those storm clouds that, that may be just over the horizon and providing us with that key ability to ask what if questions. What if questions um, that allow us to make uh, more informed decisions um, that can lower the burden of, of infection within our communities and, uh, and help uh, stave off healthcare system overload. So I've provided you this, this uh, brief of, of glimpse of these models, approximately uh, uh, two months uh, to uh, a month to two months in the offing for various models that gives us a, a glimpse of uh, gives a glimpse of, of where we're at. This work would never have been possible without the foundational um, collaboration of a partnership with the Saskatchewan Health Authority, um, led by Jenny Bazran, extraordinary in her leadership. Um, the cooperation of Maureen Anderson um, from the epidemiology side, uh, the uh, tremendous assistance of uh, uh, those throughout the Saskatchewan healthcare system, um, support of Ministry of Health and uh, and those in eHealth, um, providing uh, support and the support of, um, of of Health Quality Council, and and supporting UN and, and pursuing this work, which uh, um, which which came out of our our group's activities even during our work time. Um, uh, I want to uh, particularly thank um, uh, the students who have made this work possible. Um, good models, um, like children, um, uh, are, are, are made by a village, are raised by a village. Um, um, and uh, I'm only listing some of those here, but I want to offer my, uh, my specific thanks to uh, Yuan Tian, um, after Winchell uh, Tian, um, uh, Wade McDonald, Yang Chin, uh, Liu Jie Juan, uh, uh, Li Xiaoyan, and, um, and to others such as uh, Janelle Bershide on the uh, uh, social media um, uh, mining that provides insight into the messaging side and, and perception side, um, to uh, Leah Lamp for her extraordinary work with agent-based particle filtering, to Dr. Jiuxian Liu, um, for her her ongoing guidance with respect to uh, the combination of sequential Monte Carlo methods and um, and dynamic models, um, and to the extraordinary work of the team uh, throughout Saskatchewan's healthcare system and their vision and their action to help lower the burden of COVID nineteen within our province, and uh, once again to put Saskatchewan in a leadership position much as was realized with earlier conditions such as TB, um, to, 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 to lead the world in showing how we can prevent some of the devastating consequences of, of a pathogen um, seen elsewhere uh, within the, 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 the confines of our fair province. Thank you so much, and I look forward to updating you with uh, progress of this work um, over coming weeks. I'm grateful for your attention and uh, for your uh, support for this continued work.